State Senator, and Moki Macias, Executive Director of Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative. And the panel today will be moderated by Ron Bronstein from The Atlantic. Please join me in welcoming our next panel. There's the water. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this uh, terrific panel uh, talking about the future of justice reform and public safety with a special focus on Georgia and Atlanta. So um, it would not be exactly a news bulletin to say that this has been a pretty conservative Republican controlled legislature in the last few years on abortion, on voting, uh, on classroom discussions about race. Uh, and yet you have had some victories uh, over these last few years in the, in, in the criminal uh, justice space. Um, uh, SB 288 on sealing criminal records. Uh, you've had, we were talking about on um, a probation, at, on uh, uh, preventing people from losing their driver's licenses. So uh, let me start by asking you, Senator Anderson, in this climate, and, 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 and important to note there have been other priorities that have not advanced, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but in this climate, where the general tenor of the legislature has been toward emphasizing conservative priorities, what's been the key to achieving some successes in this area? Well, thank you for that question. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, as a state senator in the minority of a majority controlled uh, legislature, I have to say that uh, relationships matter. I was, prior to being a state senator, I was a state representative. And um, knowing the people in my district, knowing the effects of um, what criminal justice reform can do, um, and as serving as a chair of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus, the largest caucus, um, the relationships absolutely matter. Um, presenting this bill was an idea, actually, um, when I attended a conference in DC, and uh, one of my colleagues in Philadelphia presented it and I took notes and I said, hey, I'm gonna introduce this when I get back to Georgia. Had no idea. Which bill you're referring to? Sorry. Senate Bill 288. 288, yep, okay, yep. Had no idea um, how, uh, but I knew that I had to uh, push forward with it. And so relationships um, and working with those who are on the other side of the aisle to get it done actually made it happen. Brenda, can I ask you the same question? What, what, what's allowed for some of these things to move forward in an environment where the current is mostly flowing in a different direction? Sure, so I think, um, and by the way, I'm with Georgia Justice Project. We're a nonprofit legal services organization, um, not about a mile from here, and we do uh, direct service policy reform and education and outreach. And on the policy side, we have been working for about 12 years and have worked on successfully 22 laws that have passed in this space and have had some of our biggest successes in the last three years, surprisingly. So we had worked closely with um, Governor Deal and the Council on Criminal Justice Reform, which got a lot of attention nationally um, and were able to get some stuff across the finish line. But Senate Bill 288 in, in you know, 20 and probation, major probation reform in 21 and then driver's license reform. And I think the way it's a lot about framing um, it, relationships also, as Senator Anderson said, but we have largely sort of presented our agenda as a workforce agenda, um, even when it is something like probation reform and worked for years, we've worked closely with employers to get their feedback on, you know, what, what do you need uh, in terms of policy change to be able to employ more people that have a criminal record and you know educating them about issues even front end issues like like driver's licenses and probation so we, when we were working in 2020 which was this very strange session where you know stopped in the middle because of covid and then we came back after all of the the protests um, and george floyd's murder we had um, several employers step up to the plate mm. like ups and home depot we worked georgia closely power. Georgia, georgia power worked closely with the metro atlanta chamber 
And really employers were present in a way that they had not been as a voice on this issue. So I think um, in addition to what Senator Andrews said, said, that was one of the major things that shifted. And we continue to use that framing because there are a lot of labor shortages in Georgia. I was right going to say, what, what brought them over the line to become more involved than they had been before the, the, the business community? I think actually the labor shortages, we pre I presented the bill or we um, presented the bill. And I say that because um, I worked on the bill and did not have an idea that the Georgia Justice Project was trying to do the same bill for mm. about eight or 10 years. Wow. I just presented my bill and said, I'm going, I'm doing it and it's going to happen. Um, and they found me and said, hey, where did you get this bill from? I'm like, an idea from another colleague. So we, we collaborated. Um, and it was about economic development and building Georgia and Georgia um, leaders always say, oh, we're the number one state for business. We're the number one state for business. Well, I'm like, we should also be the number one state for criminal justice reform. Um, although we're behind in a lot of areas when it comes to that, we should be number one. Okay, I'm gonna bring you in a minute to talk about your program and how it fits in here. But let me just follow up on, so the, the SB 288, uh, that about sealing records on misdemeanor convictions, um, that has actually been in effect since what, 2020? That has been in effect for a while. What is the impact you are seeing from it at this point? What, what, it's been around long enough, maybe do you have some idea? Yeah, so it does a couple of things. It does, this was really the first time that Georgia had any expungement or for convictions. So we were way behind most other states. So a person can seal up to two misdemeanor convictions and a felony conviction if it has been pardoned. So that's a bit of a narrow path, but um, it is a path for felonies as well. Um, one effect is that we in my organization where we represent people um, with criminal records are sort of overwhelmed with requests for help. All these people that have had convictions on their record for years are suddenly like, I, I can get it off. And we actually just looked at our, our clients and our people that are applying and our average age at application is 43, but the average age that they got their criminal record was around 22. Wow. So people have been walking around struggling for two decades with a conviction on their record, and now they finally have an opportunity. And then one other thing related to what we were talking about with employers that I wanted to mention is that this bill also contains some of the strongest liability protections in the country for employers. Um, who engage in second chance hiring. So they are protected if the person got an expungement or if the record is irrelevant. So it's pretty broad. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work to make sure employers know about those liability protections. Do we have any idea how many people overall uh, have used the opportunity to seal records? Not enough. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's been a very narrow um, number. The reason being one is because um, even though it passed in 2020, the governor didn't sign it until much later and it didn't come into effect until 2021. Mm -hmm. So we're putting, the, trying to get the word out as much as possible, um, documentaries, anything that we can do uh, to make sure that people are aware um, that this is an option, this is a possibility, this is a game change, this is a life-changing moment, you know, for people who, as Brenda said, have been struggling for decades. Um, and this is an inaugural bill. And I'm very proud to say, you know, that the support is there, but we're also moving in a direction to, make people aware and help them uh, in the process. So I'm always referring people to the Georgia Justice Project. I'm hosting um, expungement events in my district and I have the strong support of a lot of the um, solicitor generals that represent um, several counties. All right, we're gonna come back to the state agenda in a minute, but let's, let's talk about your program here because you're working more at the local level and it's, it's, it's the Atlanta Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative, right? Um, talk explain to the audience a little bit about um, uh, what how the program works and what kind of people you work with what kind of folks you work with sure yeah thank you um, so I recognize it's a bit of a mouthful so we usually say pad affection pad yes that's right the pad initiative um, so what we do with pad is you know at, at its most fundamental our goal is to change our collective response to how we respond to public suffering Right, which may often arise, give rise to, I should say, um, to public disorder, right? Um, so since 2017, we have provided pre-arrest diversion response to law enforcement when they're engaging with an individual who they would otherwise arrest. They would otherwise arrest them for um, any activity related to poverty, when it comes to your survival offenses, if you will, um, to mental health concerns or to substance use. We provide that immediate alternative to arrest, knowing that you know 
police are the default response in our city as well as still across the country to these kinds of public disorder concerns um, because people don't have access to the resources that they need. Um, in 2020 though, excuse me, in 2021, we launched a partnership with the city of Atlanta to actually provide the opportunity for people to call for a non-police response for these types of concerns. So um, in 2021, the city of Atlanta offered the ability for people to call the 311 line, which you know most many cities have it now, but it's basically the non-emergency city services line. They can now call that line to request a pad response. So our team will go out for issues related to disturbances, for issues related to, you know, somebody is yelling in front of my business, I'm concerned, right? Um, for issues related to, you know, what we may perceive as a mental health concern or substance use concern. Um, and, you know, these are the kinds of calls that would most likely before this project, it would have gone into 911. It would have elicited a police response. Um, so it's an opportunity for our teams to actually go out, assess what you know what's going on with the person, offer resources, but really respond with care and respond with sort of a problem solving approach related to connecting people to resources rather than an automatic punitive approach. So what what kind of team? What does your team look like? Who who I have some of you say someone's in front of the business, they're in distress, they're shouting. They call 311. What happens at that point? Who shows up at the door? Sure. So we work closely with the team at 311 to, you know, they will assess the call. They will make sure that it's a good fit for our team to go out. And then we have two person teams. They go out in, you know, kind of branded pad vans. They show up in a t shirt that says a new approach to community safety and wellness pad, um, you know, very clearly not law enforcement. Um, and these are folks that have worked in the behavioral health field, they're folks that have worked doing street outreach. They're folks that have worked extensively with people who may be experiencing homelessness or may be experiencing a behavioral health concern. And really the name of the game for us, for us is harm reduction, right? These are harm reduction response teams. Mm -hmm. So folks are showing up not to compel people to do anything, not to enforce any laws, but instead to engage the person on a person to person level and just assess, you know, are there basic needs that person has? You know, is there a way to address the situation through, um, you know, offering a meal or just letting them know, hey, somebody called because they were concerned. We don't want it to escalate to police involvement. So how can we help you be more safe in this moment? Mm -hmm. And what kind of services can you offer people at that moment? Yeah, so, you know, I think this is, this is really the, the key, right? Um, we know that, police are the pathway to jail, right? Alternate response teams, however, are really, you know, we're a pathway to a broken anemic infrastructure of resources that often mm. don't even exist, right? Uh, so, a bridge to nowhere, as th someone said in Congress. That's once. right. So, yes. you know, so I, I, we want to be really clear, right, that, you know, we believe an alternate response is is often much more appropriate than a police response, but we are the pathway, right? We do our best to provide direct resources related to, you know, we provide direct respite housing, we provide food assistance, transportation mm -hmm. assistance, connection to behavioral health resources, but we, we cannot be alone, a sort of catch all human services infrastructure that really needs substantial more investment. And on the other track, when the, the alternative is available for, so the police might be called and do they essentially call the same team at that point if they want to avail themselves of you of the pad alternative or how does that work when, when someone dials 911 mm -hmm. first? Yeah, that's right. So police officers are able to call us through a dedicated line. So they're not going through the public line that that, you know, regular folks would be, um, but they're able to call our same teams, those same teams go out. Um, the other thing that we're working on now is actually for some calls that come into 911 to be able to actually transfer those calls into the 311 system. So actually this month coming up, we're going to be um, taking public indecency calls out of the 911 system because mm. we know particularly, you know, those kind of calls tend to be related to mental health or substance use. How did this get started? I mean, how did the city decide to do this to, to, to build this arrangement with you? in the first place. I think a lot of people are kind of wondering that about their own community. Like what's the first step toward causing this to happen? Sure, well, I, you know, I would go back to what Senator Anderson said that, you know, it, it really is about relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, back to what, what, what Brenda shared, it's also about um, public will and community pressure, right? We see the way in which um, employers got on board in response to 
the, the national and local mobilization of people saying black and brown communities have suffered too much at the hands of this criminal legal system and we need change, right? Um, so locally, you know, it, very similarly, um, you know, it, it kind of was a, resulted from a very similar dynamic. Um, organizers and folks in the city that were impacted by policing of these sort of low level issues came together and said, we need something different. We recognize that police are often the first responders. We need a different kind of first responder. You, you know, it's really interesting. And I'd love to have both of you comment on, on this as well, because if I live in California and we obviously had the recall of the San Francisco DA, Chesa Boudin earlier this year. And I think there were a lot of people who felt that was more about disorder than it was about crime. It wasn't like the crime stats in San Francisco were going through the roof, but there was a sense of people that there was more disorder on the street than they wanted to live with. And it was not really a priority of his, and we can talk about how it's worked out after. It's not really the issue. This seems kind of like a third way. I mean, this is, this is saying on the one hand, yes, business person, your concern about someone screaming in front of your business is legit. Somebody should be responding, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the response has to be a full scale, you know, Adam 12 kind of pulling up uh, with, with, with uh, guns drawn. I I'm just interested in what you, what you make of, of this as a way of responding to both community concerns and concerns about over-incarceration. I think it is brilliant. Um, police are trained to respond the way that they respond. Um, and a lot of times there is no filter. Uh, and so having this type of program is excellent. Um, everyone doesn't need an Adam 12. Um, different people call 911 for different reasons. It is the caller and the receiver as to how the police responds. It is also yeah. having a... Um, I guess I would call it a intervention, a level of intervention with the uh, 311 and your, the, your program um, to save lives um, and to help redirect um, something that has been escalated that really probably should not be. Yeah. Are there other cities in Georgia that are doing this? I'm not aware of any other cities that are using 311. Um, many of our smaller cities don't, in fact, have 311 either as mm. sort of a, a public line like that. Um, but there are other communities around the state, um, including in Athens and Savannah, that have done some great work in alternate response and co-response. Yeah. Brenda, let, let, let me, let's go back to the, to the state level, because we, we were talking before about one area that people may not focus on that much, which is driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. And the large number of people who have their licenses suspended and the large number of people who are arrested for driving with suspended mm -hmm. licenses uh, after. Um, there, there has been legislation that, that passed uh, trying to deal with this. Talk about what the state has done and how far it respond, how far it goes in responding to the underlying challenge. Yeah, we were able to take a, a small step towards reform this last session with Senate Bill 10. So in Georgia, um, which this is a problem nationwide, and there's folks looking at this issue all across the country, but in Georgia, about 200,000 folks a year get their driver's license suspended for offenses that are unrelated to, to driving or a public safety. So not they ran a stop sign or you know any, they got in an accident, but either because they can't pay or haven't paid their child support and their license gets suspended for that reason, or because they have a failure to appear. They've missed court for whatever reason. There's many reasons why people miss court. Um, we don't have a great notice system in most, um, in, in most jurisdictions in Georgia. You know, things got particularly crazy during the pandemic of knowing you know, when you could go to court and when it was going to be closed. So we were to address a, a portion of that, which is folks that were getting their driver's license suspended because they missed court. And it used to be that if that happened, your license was automatically suspended. You had to go through and adjudicate the underlying case completely and pay any fines and fees before you could get your license back. Um, Georgia, we don't have great public transit in Georgia. Many people need to be able to drive and continue to drive even when their license is suspended, which is why we have this 50,000 arrests related to it. So what we did through this bill is we were able to give some discretion back to the judges. If a person comes back and says, you know, I missed court. Um, this is why that the judge could then pull back that suspension and waive the fees related to that. So we worked with the council of municipal court judges that see this mm. most often because they wanted a path to be able to do it as well. 
Um, so that just went into effect a couple of months ago and we're doing as much as we can to get the word out about it. Senator Anderson, um, you, I mentioned earlier, there's been a bunch of stuff that's passed and then there's some stuff that has not. And uh, SB 257, which is, which is I think your bill that, that, that moves further on a lot of these areas uh, did not clear the legislature this year. Uh, talk about what you were trying to do. What was the roadblock you ran into and do you see a future for it? So Senate Bill 257 um, is an expansion of Senate Bill 288 from the previous legislature here. So it doesn't, the numbers aren't in sequence or in order because of that. Um, so it was, it was a, a um, effort to expand the reach for, to allow people to restrict and seal their records. So it went as far as to include um, those who have been pardoned by the Board of Pardon and Paroles. So that process is an arduous process. It is very lengthy, it is very extensive. You cannot just get a pardon. Um, and when people actually attain that goal or um, you know, be successful in that effort, they should not still be trying to defend walking around, as I say, in my length, in my terms, walking around with a piece of paper proving that they have been pardoned. Mm. It's humiliating and it's frustrating for people who have already gone through that process. So that bill um, expanded 288 to allow for that to happen. Um, and the it passed the Senate unanimous, well, with two, maybe two people, but it passed the Senate got to the house and got in the rules committee. And that's where the politics um, turned up to about 10 plus. Mm. Um, and so the last day of the session, you know, the, it had been kicked, the can had been kicked down the road and the last day of session and everybody in committee, you know, house committee agreed that this is a great bill, even convinced the, the chair who was a little leery about it. Um, they said, oh, this is a good bill. Come on, let's just, let's just pass it out. Um, but again, got to rules on the last day and, and politics uh, came into play. But I do know and believe that it will come up again. And I do believe that it will pass. Mm -hmm. So you think it was just a kind of a, a partisan end of the session game game. Say it. But but <laughs> do you is there is there substantive resistance from law enforcement from elements of the of the majority party in the, I mean, it, or, or do you think you're, 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 you're in pretty good shape? So initially we had, oh, and it included um, expanding the, the uh, one of the um, accounts of theft by taking. It, it made sure that that was um, included in the original bill, well, making it a, a part of the original bill. <clears throat> so I do believe that Initially, um, the board of pardon and paroles, you know, people are just alarming folks for no reason. Mm. Um, and they were fine with it. The sheriff's association was a little like, I don't know. Um, but then I had some sheriffs say, hey, look, we don't want the people in the jail. They haven't done anything. We're holding people who really aren't any harm to society. So why are we doing this? Um, so I had both sides of that. And uh, so I think at this point, the conversations have been had and, um, the people are ready, people are ready to move forward with it. Speaking of people who are in jail, we are in Atlanta. Yes. So I think we have to spend a few minutes talking about the Atlanta City Detention Center, mm -hmm. um, which uh, as you know, uh, there was, have been a push for years to convert into uh, a, a different use, uh, into a, um, a diversion center. Um, and this summer, the city council voted and then the Fulton County commissioners voted instead uh, to lease it for four years to the county, beds, beds to it to the county sheriff to deal with overcrowding uh, in, the, in the county jails. You served on the task force that produced the original recommendation uh, to transform it into a social service center. Can you walk the audience, because people here from around the country, can you walk the audience through the, the history of this debate, what the goal was and where we are now? Well, question. <laughs> sure. Um, you can just start with what the building is. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so prior to the Olympics coming to town in 1996, um, the city decided to build a new jail 
they built a jail only for municipal offenses. And then they added, a, the, our city uh, council added a whole bunch of new offenses to the books, including offenses that we are still having to deal with today, mm. panhandling, public urination, those types of you know, very low level public order, order city ordinances. Um, when the Olympics came, the jail was filled entirely. Um, and since then, it has been a place that the city has, you know, has basically rented out to various entities. Um, in our previous administration, Mayor Bottoms uh, actually ended the contract with ICE as a result of you know, organizing um, because of conditions of, um, of the detain of detention of folks um, detained by ICE. And so with, the, with that move, and then with the, the cash bail reform that the city also enacted, we've seen that jail population decrease dramatically. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, it's a building at the very end of Peachtree Street. It's, it's the last building in downtown Atlanta. Um, and currently that building detains about at tops 50 people per night on either city ordinance violations or actually traffic violations as well. And its capacity is significantly more than that, That's right? right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so I think, I believe the capacity is 2,600. Mm. Um, so there has been a multi-year effort. There has been a campaign led by Women on the Rise, which is an organization run by formerly incarcerated women um, to transform that jail. It is, you know, an extra jail in the city. Um, and there's a campaign, you know, there's been a very active campaign to transform that jail um, that has had many twists and turns in terms of, you know, what, what it could be, how, you know, how that transition could be done. Um, and, you know, I think what, what we have been really excited to be a part of is that actually we made some progress on that last year. Um, we've worked very closely through our um, partnerships with the city and Fulton County. Um, we, who's we in that sentence? Sorry, PAD, PAD. as well as other community organizations, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So it's really been a, I think, a beautiful example of collective effort. We've got community-based organizations, we've got the city, we've got the county, and we also have folks from the state um, that have been working on this idea of a diversion center, right? That, you know, it's not the, it's not the be all end all of all the resources we need, right? But it is the diversion, the divert to what? Right. It is, you know, if folks are taking are going to the jail when the police come, where are folks going actually in that moment when um, when folks like Pat show up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working for many years with this with this collaborative group to design a diversion center. Um, you know, we've learned from our, our friends over in Tucson. We've learned from our friends over in Houston around what they have done very successfully. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of our neighborhoods in Atlanta don't want a 24 seven drop off for law enforcement in their community. So, um, you know, those also tend to be the folks that don't want supportive housing in their communities. And, you know, that's part of why we're here in the first place. Um, but what we found was that there was a big building right at the end of Peachtree Street that could actually work quite well for a diversion mm -hmm. center. And so we've got alignment from the city and the county to do that. We received federal dollars as well as private dollars to be able to do that. So um, we actually just completed renderings for a diversion center that is on the in the administrative portion of that jail. And you know, it sounds- So that is still going forward. It is, that's correct. While other part of the jail is being leased to the county. So it hasn't been leased yet. Right, but um, but the both both parties have there's a process now. There's a ninety day, but these two just to make sure I understand these two things are going to coexist. That they will be the diversion center, and if the, if the deal goes through, they will be leasing. So I know it sounds a bit odd to put a diversion center inside of a jail. Yes, you know. <clears throat> But then again, nobody else wanted the diversion center, right? Um, but what is inspiring to us is the idea of being able to start the conversion of that facility through this diversion center, mm -hmm. right? Because we're talking about the same people, right? The yeah. same people who are getting arrested and brought in the front door are the folks that could otherwise actually just be brought to the diversion center door, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that process of converting a portion of the jail, of the jail in order to serve as this 24 hour diversion center and sobering center, because Fulton County has neither a sobering center nor a crisis center um, currently. So it, that process is ongoing and it is slated to open next year. That okay. said, 
we are now in a, a bit of a different situation because there is a proposal um, and there is a lease agreement on the table to lease 700 beds of that facility right. to Fulton County Jail. And so Brenda, what, what are the implications of that? If that agreement, assuming, I, I understand they're in, the, they're in the process of reviewing the lease now, but assuming that that goes through at both the city council and the county commission commissioners have voted, <clears throat> what do you make of that decision? What are the implications of keeping the jail open for that purpose? Well, I think for those of us that have, and we were a later partner to the diversion center, but for those of us that are working on it, that it's not <clears throat> ideal that, that these two things need to coexist in the same space, but they can. And the lease is temporary. So it, it is not, and I think advocates will continue to work to make sure that this temporary lease of beds does not continue and that the diversion center and other programs actually provide alternatives to keep people out of the jail. So overflow isn't needed. I think the number is like 13 people a day could potentially be diverted from the Fulton County Jail, which has about 41,000 admissions a year. <clears throat> so I, the hope is, you know, this is a proof of concept. Once we get, get the diversion center up and running um, and our role there is gonna be to help um, folks that have warrants that might for minor things that might prevent them from being able to be diverted is that that space won't be needed. So it's not an ideal situation sort of philosophically. And you know we don't want people to feel like they are being held in a jail, but there will be separate entrances and this is a temporary um, fix. That... Senator, Senator Anderson, do you, have, do you have a thought about this decision? <clears throat> I, I, is it, the mayor has said four years and we're out, this is it. Others have said the city is gonna, is a significant amount of revenue that is going to be associated with with this incarceration that the city is going to receive? I mean, are you confident that this is four years and done, or or do you think this could be very difficult to uproot once it's in place? I think we will have to work to help mm. um, make sure that um, those conversations are are. Um, follow through with and give assistance as much as possible to um, programs like um, Mokis because we can't just rely on one organization. We all have to put our hands um, and, and ingredients in the pot and stir it and make it, make it better than what it is. Yeah, Moki, did this, was this, before I change to another subject, was this coming, I mean, did you see this coming for a while or was this sort of very sudden, this agreement with the county? Did, did it seem like you were on the track toward completely converting the facility. So Fulton County Jail has been overcrowded for decades. Mm -hmm. um, we, we recognize that currently there is an overcrowding problem at Fulton County Jail, um, but that also there are very clear procedural and um, policy issues that could be fixed in order to reduce the number both of people coming into the jail, as well as the number who are continuing to stay there unindicted or on very low bonds. So there's a lot of fixes to jail overcrowding here locally that we haven't yet tried. And, and does, does creating this spillover space in effect reduce the pressure on them to deal with the underlying problems, the, the fixes that you were just describing? I mean, is, is, is that part of the problem here? If you get more space, you have less incentive to deal with the question of whether you should be holding that many people at all? Yeah, and you know, I mean, we, we would never want to use human beings as, uh, as, as pressure, right? Um, in that any person that could get out now be, for a more proper release or for a diversion, um, we want to get them out now. And actually we believe that or, there's- Let me, let me turn around the question then. Could. Is, the, is the county using the extra space as a way to avoid dealing with the underlying <laughs> issues? I think, you know, I think this is, is actually a really, um, is a perfect audience to consider the question of, you know, whether there are more appropriate solutions to overcrowding. Um, I think that on some level it is about aligning our theory of change, right? If we believe that there are other ways to address um, public safety, then our investments need to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of continuing to do the same failed strategies, which is lock people up. I'm gonna bring in the audience in a few minutes for questions, but let me, let me get to, because this really gets to kind of the moment where we are in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy debate and the politics around criminal justice reform 
and safety. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of momentum in, in Atlanta, specifically after the murder of George Floyd for a very different kind of direction on a, on a whole range of issues, including police budgets. Um, when Mayor Bottoms left, she said in her exit interview with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, when crime is bad, it overshadows every single thing. So as someone who's an elected officer, I'm gonna start with you and then come this way. In an environment where people are, people's concerns about safety are rising and crime, though not nearly as high as it was in the 90s, is clearly higher in many cities than it was earlier in, the, in this century. Is it possible to sustain momentum for reform without a, a sense that crime is coming down? It, can you sustain momentum for reform when people are worried about the number of homicides that they're seeing and the rate of crime? I think so. Um, and I say that because, okay, so before I was a state rep, I was a mayor, um, which is why I was very careful about that last question. Mm -hmm. Um, but it can. It, it, it's, it's about partnerships. So cities rely on counties. Counties rely on states. If, if this is a serious concern, then we um, connect to, to that which is a support. So as a mayor, she has to, to rely on the county, who has to rely, both rely on the yeah. state, who... All three of us now have to rely on the federal government. We, I mean, the, the partnerships have to be strong and in place and we have to re forget the politics, focus on, um, I don't wanna say the problem, but the people um, and, and, and move it forward to where we're consistently saying the same message. We're consistently doing the work. We're consistently partnering with those who are experts at doing the work, giving us what we need um, to pass laws and you know, have funding to, to make this happen. And it can happen across Metro Atlanta um, as a whole. Brenda? I mean, public safety is the whole reason for criminal justice reform. And I think anybody that's even paying a little bit of attention knows that what we're doing is not working. So I, I don't think uh, those are exclusive. And mm -hmm. I, I feel hopeful, you know, with these conversations that have happened in these relationships we've built over the last couple of years that other, you know, sort of unlikely allies are showing up to think about things like employers. Um, and one thing that has made us really hopeful is you know, we started and still do criminal defense as part of our work. And we would refer to prosecutors as the dark side. You know, those were the, the folks that you know, were our enemies. But we, over the last few years, we have built real partnerships with prosecutors around the state to hold record clearing events. Um, we opened a second chance desk in Cobb County last year and worked closely with the district, you know, the misdemeanor prosecutor and the felony prosecutor out there. Um, next week, we're launching a new initiative uh, built around restorative justice, a center for restorative justice. And we already have several district attorneys lined up to partner with us on that and divert cases that they think are a good um, fit for a restorative justice process that is victim-centered um, to be facilitated in that way because you know they want their job is not to lock people up it's yep. to make the community safer so i don't i think we will continue to have um positive conversations and developments because people are looking for solutions that work Moki, I mean, many of the, I mean, the paradox always is that many of the communities that are the most concerned about the impact of intensive policing are also the places that are the most uh, vulnerable to when, when crime rates are up, when, when shootings are up and homicides are, how do you reconcile that? How do you provide safety for communities um, while also preserving kind of, you know, the rights and the, uh, of the people who live there? I think, you know, it goes to I think the comment that we heard earlier this morning that I think we need to sort of be very clear about what we're defining as safety and what creates safety, right? Um, you know, we have to think about the investments in sort of human-centered infrastructure that we need that would actually produce more safety for our communities, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the response of, uh, you know, a police department to an incident once harm has already occurred is a very, very narrow definition 
of public safety. And that is where we continue to be stuck, right? So, you know, I, I think that the idea, you know, when, when tough on crime and sort of like the public safety rhetoric gets kind of, uh, you know, heightened during periods like this, um, you know, I think policymakers sometimes would, would like to us to believe that you can have both tough on crime and criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. When in fact, what we need are people to boldly say, these strategies have not produced safety for our communities and particularly for black communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if they have not produced safety, then we have a lot more learning to do. We have a lot more listening to do. And we have a lot more investing to do in those things that communities themselves are saying will produce safety. If, if someone were to ask you, why are homicides higher in Atlanta than they were a few years ago or Philadelphia? What would be your short answer? Well, we have just all as a country, as a world lived through massive collective trauma. People have experienced incredible grief and loss. People have experienced incredible economic hardship. And we have done so in an environment of, uh, you know, a toxic political environment. If we do not expect that interpersonal harm, which is the, the driving force of these of, of homicides, right? If we do not expect that interpersonal harm as well as mental health would um, be impacted by the kind of world we've been living in over the last three years, you know, it, it's, that would be absurd, right? Before I go to the audience, do either of you want to add to that, that question? In your mind, obviously that is, a, that is a focal point in the political debate in so many communities that homicides are up compared to certainly seven, eight years ago. Thoughts on why that's happening and whether that is in effect an indictment of alternative approaches. For me, oh, you want to go first? <laughs> so uh, Moki made a very, very great points. Um, when, I, when I introduced this bill, um, the first thing that came to my mind was hope. If people don't have hope, then they absolutely have nothing. I don't want to say nothing, but if, 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 if the system, and I say this and I mean it, the system was designed to fail, then when I consistently try, there's really no need to try because then I'm back to nothing, to where I was. Um, so people have to have hope. And with the hardships, with economic injustice, uh, criminal justice injustice, all the injustices that happen in our system that have been designed for failure, then to exasperate and add on trauma and mental health and a, a, a pandemic and you know all those things that consistently um, test people, then we have to provide, we have to provide outlets of hope. Brenda, do you want to add or do you want to turn it to the crowd? Well, just one yeah. thing I would add, which Moki already mentioned is just the lack of mental health services. You know, I think over 40% of the folks that are at Fulton County Jail at any given day have a diagnosed mental health condition. So until we provide adequate services for those folks, I think we're gonna, we're gonna be caught in this cycle. All right, so I think we have microphones. Hopefully we have questions for the microphones. Any hands over there? Yep, in the back. Uh, so yes, uh, so I have a question around uh, kind of the, the point around strategy and approach. I think two things come to mind when I was kind of hearing you, got, you all speak. One was around the importance of like coordination of care and coordination of services for the supports when folks are diverted away from the system and what supports and services that they get. I know you spoke of like the, the, the mental, the press and mental health needs. I just would uh, like to learn more about like what, what is being done to kind of help provide those services or coordinate the care in a way that is like effective and efficient. And then the second thing that is coming to mind is this idea of like, um, the like how can like the private sector or the private you know industry become part of the conversation in terms of helping address some of the needs or filling in the gaps i know there's often conversations around like education and training and workforce development and i think in order to like really maximize those opportunities i think private sector engagement might be useful you want to start moki maybe Thing. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so when we connect, when we connect with somebody through 311 or through a law enforcement diversion, 
um, we are first off trying to figure out where somebody may have already been receiving services or having, you know, having connection to some resources or support. Um, and we tr try and foster those reconnections, try and foster community and family reconnections as well. Um, and then we're really trying to, we're building these person-centered plans to, um, to figure out what exactly people need and what would work best for them. So we're doing a lot of referrals, we're doing a lot of warm handoffs, but what I'd like to lift up is actually a project that's led by our um, Fulton County Superior Court, our Familiar Faces project. Um, and, you know, that's really, I think, a great example of how we have connected um, our systems better so that, you know, when we know that the same individual is going into the jail who is going to our psych emergency room at Grady Memorial Hospital, who may be being diverted to PAD. Um, if we can communicate with each other and help strategize uh, to get that person the help they need whenever they come in contact with any one of these systems, that's really an opportunity for us for, um, you know, to make sure that the systems are talking to each other where we can for these individuals that um, otherwise are sort of bumping around between them. Can I can I follow? I, I, just, I was thinking from that question. Um, we talked before about the political role of business in terms of supporting some of these initiatives. What about the operational role in terms of hiring formerly incarcerated people? In terms of commitments, of, uh, which I think the the questioner was getting at, is there a commitment beyond writing a letter to the legislature or testifying in front of a committee that that goes to the to the the operational impact of these initiatives? Yeah, we. We've been engaging with employers, like I mentioned, for for years, and they, you know, I think often employers weren't invited to these conversations, and that's why they they weren't a part of them. And so we started having sort of off the record conversations, and you know, eventually we're able to get them to the point where they were more um, familiar with the issues and willing to speak out at the Capitol. Um, we, you know, we've been doing criminal records work for a number of years and trying to talk to employers. Like I mentioned before, like we're overwhelmed with requests from employers right now who say, you know, can you help us with second chance hiring? Can you send people to us? Mm. I mean, it, it's just the reality in the country that we are we have a labor shortage that isn't going anywhere. It's not just related to the pandemic. It sort of sped it up, but you just um, with birth rates and immigration, it's happening. And so they have to come to the table. The, the and they... 2010s was the slowest decoration, de de decade for population growth in the US, except for the depression in American history. I mean, the population increased less in the, in the past decade than at any previous point. So that, that pressure clearly uh, exists. Do you want anything or should we go to? Uh, no, I just, well, I'll just add that um, to, to Brenda's point that employees are now, you know, in a place that, um, with with the um, measures in place to to help protect, they are more, you know, interested in let's move forward with this because it is not just a thing to do, but the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think it's act actually going to help um, uplift and to build our uh, labor um, numbers. All right. Another question. And I see a mic moving. So one moment. Um, I was just curious um, for the diversion center, what's the capacity that you're looking to have for that? Since you did mention the jail holds like 2,600 people, obviously a portion of that might get leased, but it still sounds like a lot of space. So I was just curious. Sure. So, so this diversion center would sort of be phase one. Um, it would have a capacity of about 40, 45 people on the diversion side, and I think a little like under 20 on the sobering side, um, but it, it's a 24 hour facility, right? And we're expecting that people would show up, we would get them connected. Um, there would be some folks who would stay longer, but many folks wouldn't stay that long. So it really, it's just, it's a landing place um, that is available 24 hours so that people don't land at the jail. That said that, you know, the building itself has a substantial amount of capacity that could be used for other services and supports. You are earning your pay. <laughs> she is. Um, I was interested when you were talking about the DL legislation. So I'm from Minnesota and we just finally after four years got 
some similar legislation passed. And I'm a city prosecutor in Minneapolis. And so we, a lot of our caseload are these driving cases. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. You know, one of my frustrations is when we would talk to the legislators to try to convince them this was the right thing to do. You know, we got, well, you're giving them a free pass. There's no accountability. And I would say, okay, but how can someone be held, you know, how can they, how can you deem them to be not accountable for not paying a fine when they don't have, you know, the it's a choice between rent or or fine. And and you know, it was super frustrating for me to see because I'm like, you think this works to incentivize people to pay fines when they have no money. And mm. so, you know, as we try to move some of these reforms and everything's about accountability, it looks like we're giving people a slap on the wrist or no accountability. How do you, especially from your perspective, you know, how do we talk to people about what we see every day? Like this doesn't work. It mm. doesn't make people any more accountable or less accountable. There's factors right. that, you know, um, cause I just, we took us four years to convince people this was the right thing to do to stop suspending licenses for unpaid fines and fees and failing to appear in court and that it wasn't going to, you know, impact public safety in a negative way. Yeah. Um, so I just wonder what your yeah. thoughts are on having those kind of discussions. Senator um, Anderson, you want to speak up? I'll be glad to. Yeah. <laughs> so I would not take no for an answer. <laughs> if you just can sense my personality, I would not take no for an answer. Um, initially when I, uh, as I said, heard about the bill, presented it, I came back and I said, this can happen in Georgia. Had the conversation, you know, with, with some colleagues who had previously served in the house with me is the relationship part. Um, he's an attorney and I said, I need help with this bill. To, to look at my bill initially, I think they had to, you guys had to like really dig and find for bipartisan support. I was just that adamant about this bill is going to pass, had my leadership on it. And as chair of the Black Caucus, I'm like, okay, you'll really have to fight me. Um, but I wouldn't take no for an answer. And to have the conversation, I had to make it relatable. You know, um, didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I had to make it relatable. When it came to, oh, it was just gonna be about misdemeanors. I was like, no, it's not. You're gonna add some felonies in there. And I just kept going back. I mean, honestly, I think Brenda and, and Georgia Justice Project thought that something was gonna happen somehow. They didn't know how, but I was not taking no for an answer. And then to have their support really meant really meant a lot. So you have to find the, 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 the right support, the right um, people to have the conversation with. And I choose one or two people and they elaborate on the conversation for me to kind of get the buy-in from their, their pool and their party, because I just don't have that kind of time. Um, I'm moving on to something else, but I didn't take no for an answer. And so that's how it happened. And then to have the support um, by lobbyists and um, organizations, as well as corporations, really, really made it, really made it easy. So you have to find those key players to help move it along. Uh, let's see, you know, this side of the room has been very quiet here, just pointing out that we're getting all of our questions from, uh, from that side. Do we have anything over here? Yeah. Nope. Yes. Hi, go. Kim Davis from Cook. I heard someone mention that the diversion center was located on the same site as the jail. And I'm just wondering how does that turn into being a safe space? and a welcoming space for healing. Has there been any challenges with that setup? You talked about why a little bit, but maybe you want to repeat that. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And, and I, uh, I agree with you. I know it sounds wild. Um, what, what we were actually able to do is um, we took over the administrative part of the jail. So where the, um, our, the Atlanta Department of Corrections staff had their break room, had their offices, that sort of thing. So we were able to move the administrative offices into another part of the facility um, so that in fact, we are not in the secure detention side at all. Um, and there is an, 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 a different entrance to it that's on the back end of the building. So when you walk up to it, you actually 
it appears that you're walking into a building that is right next door to the jail instead of you're walking straight into the jail. Um, so some of it is about design. The other part of it was the agreement with the Department of Corrections locally um, to ensure that there's really a firewall between their staff, their operations, and our staffing and our operations. Um, you know, we're still in the learning process. We haven't, we are just starting the, the construction work soon, um, but there is, you know, it's a, it's a, bit of a compromise because it was very difficult to find a location. And this was a building that, you know, we're, we're looking forward to being, um, you know, conti to continue to be transformed. So we're near that moment where they're gonna you know, pull the plug on us and, and get onto the rest of their, their program. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here kind of thing. Um, uh, let me just ask each of you maybe for a final thought on where you see the biggest opportunity in Georgia or the city over the next few years to advance the cause of, of criminal justice reform. And maybe Senator Ernest, we'll start with you and come back this way. What, what do you think is gonna be your biggest opportunity? And maybe throw in, do you think you're gonna be more on the offense or more on the defense in the next few years? Well, that I will be on the, 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 the cause, the cause, the issue. Um, I think the cause will be more on the offense. We, we cannot um, continue to hold people in um, a cycle that is non-productive economically, or um, for, for productively for their life. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be on the offense. And, and I, I tend to, um, I intend to continue to champion criminal justice reform bills um, and work with those um, cities, counties, uh, solicitor generals, anyone else um, have favor with the PAC, with the prosecuting attorney's counsel uh, to continue to work with them to make sure that Georgia is moving up on the scale away from the 40s, close to that number one for criminal justice reform. Brenda, what are the next items on your to-do list? Uh, well, specifically we're working on occupational licensing reform, expanding expungement, hopefully we'll get to clean slate eventually and restorative justice um, on the policy side and on the service side. But I, the thing I'm most excited about is these unusual, unusual partnerships or relationships that we never had before, that, that there are more people coming to the table that are willing to engage in this conversation and have a data-driven conversation and talk about what really works. So it, it's not an easy road, but <laughs> but I think there's hope to be found there. And I, let me let me yeah. add to, to Brenda's point, the clean slate. I presented the bill as a clean slate act so that when once it's presented, it's, it's off of the record from every county or every offense they've had because Georgia's system is not on one um, outline, it, it has made it difficult. So, so between the 3 one program and the diversion center, you've kind of got your hands full, but what, what are you gonna be focusing on? So I'll just coming say, months? yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll just say this, you know, I think we are so tired. So many of us are just so deeply tired, you know, it locally and around the country at the, the backlash that we are receiving for, um, for the progress that we've made. Uh, and I, you know, I think, I take hope in the idea that even as our reforms get challenged, even as tough on crime rhetoric continues to raise its ugly head, um, our commitment to people's wellness, to people's freedom, to people's self-determination, to the loving grace that actually that people actually need to be able to heal, um, that is coexisting regardless, right? And it, it is enduring and that it's actually not about winning because we're never gonna win against a system that continues to right itself. It's about enduring and continuing to stay on the path of people's um, freedom and well-being. Mm -hmm. And as long as we keep doing that, everything we work on will somehow find a way. Great note on which to end. Would you join me in thanking this terrific panel? And I think we have a few closing words. Thank <laughs> you.